Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm, uh, my, uh, my name is Ansgar. I'm um, a member of the Quilt team, which is basically like a collaborative Ethereum co-development research team where between like uh, Consensus, the company, and um, the Ethereum Foundation. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about multidimensional uh, resource pricing on Ethereum, specifically in the context of EIP 1559. Um, and so basically, um, this is kind of inspired by um, um, like a, a small write-up that Vitalik um, published uh, early this year, kind of initially introducing the idea. Um, and then uh, basically since then, um, we've, been, we've been thinking about it a little bit. Um, and specifically started working on it last week. So this is all very fresh. So um, just basically as a small warning here, this is just a primer. This is basically the very first kind of thoughts that we've had around this topic. It's more about introducing the problem statement uh, and less about presenting um, a specific solution. So um, I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of a motivation. So um, this is just a screenshot of a transaction from today, actually. Um, from Etherscan, Ether and as you are probably aware of, if you've ever sent a transaction on Ethereum, right, um, you actually um, pay for the for the transaction. Um, so there's like this uh, transaction fee, the gas price, um, and the gas limit, and whatnot. Um, and a common intuition that people have when when they, when they kind of send a transaction is that, that what they actually pay for is kind of the the effort that they cause, right? The the, the basically the the the, the resource, like the, the 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 effort to the nodes to the miner. Um, that that's where the money goes. But in a sense, this, this intuition isn't quite correct, right? And um, if you look at the transaction, you have this, uh, in EIP 59, you have this new field uh, priority fee, and that is actually only the part of the transaction that pays for the inconvenience to the miner. The entire rest, and in this case, it was 50 GUE, like the vast majority of the trans transaction does not actually basically reimburse the miner, right? It, 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 it does something else. And, if you think about it, I mean, of course, it's uh, Ethereum. It's just like a normal supply-demand uh, price equilibrium. But the the the, the relative price el elasticities here um, are important. And this is just a, a graph from uh, another write-up of mine from from last year. It's not not quite on topic, but I, I thought it illustrates the point quite well. That you see that basically supply actually uh, is fixed on Ethereum, right? So there's no like when people if there's if people are willing to pay higher higher prices, you still don't get more block space, right? This is basically fixed block space. This is of course pre 1559, um, and so the the the, the uh, equilibrium is completely uh, determined by demand, right? And so basically, what pricing on Ethereum actually does, or like is supposed to do, is to ensure optimal uh, resource allocation, right? So it's not about kind of um, paying the miner for the effort, it's about actually uh, distributing resources in, a, in, a, in an e efficient way. And then with uh, ERP-5059, this looks a little bit more complex. Again, ignore the details, but like again, supply is still fixed, of course. Um, and actually, because um, this is the case, th that's actually the intuition, if you want to, why we were able to, under 1559, to burn the fees, right? Because they're not needed to basically motivate the miner to include the transaction. Um, so we can in instead basically turn them into protocol extractable value, in, in a sense. Um, so what are these resources that we want to efficiently allocate on Ethereum, right? Um, they actually, if you look into it, um, it turns out there are quite a few uh, different ones. So this is uh, definitely not a conclusive list, but some of the most, most common ones. So there's bandwidth, right? How, how big uh, are these blocks that, that are gossiped between the individual nodes? There's compute for processing the blocks, state access, uh, memory, and then, then there's state growth. So basically, like the, the state is that all, all all nodes have to have to permanently hold, and that grows forever, right? Um, and and that's expensive. But then also there's history growth, and that's that's just like the keeping the historical blocks uh, around. Um, if you if you now basically look back at the transactions we just lo looked at, as, as you might have noticed, there's only a single. Uh, price, right? There is no bandwidth price, and there's like a co no compute price, and whatnot. This is a single price, and so like an obvious question you might ask is like, how do we actually end up expressing all these different resource consumptions into a sing like in a single value, right? And as it turns out, on Ethereum, how, how we basically have been doing it from the very beginning is just that we say um, we just have we just uh, d um, set fixed relative prices, so we basically just say. Um, in addition, in the EVM, if you just want to add two values, that costs, I don't actually know, I think two or three gas. Um, and then accessing storage slot, that costs maybe a few thousand gas. So the, the relative price is basically on the order of a thousand, right? So like state access is always a thousand times more expensive than, than that specific kind of type of compute, right? Um, and of course, kind of just manually fixing these, these relative prices, that's not, not like, 
you, you can't get it quite right, but at least for the beginning, that kind of turned out to be kind of good enough, right? And so the goal was then how do we how do we kind of how, set these relative prices? Was just to say, in a worst case, right? Just imagine a block that does only additions, like every every single operation in the transaction in the block is just additions. The idea is we basically set like this maximum co a, a total limit of resource consumption in the block so that even if it's full of additions, the additions kind of like don't consume too much of the resource that they mostly use, which is compute, right? If instead the block is full of state accesses, then also it should not consume more um, than the maximum amount that we kind of determine for state accesses. So basically, this is initially how these relative prices were set. Um, if you actually look at the list of resources again, though, you relatively quickly, if you think about it, uh, start to notice that there's two different types of maximum consumption. And uh, in particular, there is the, uh, which, what's called blue here, that's uh, what, what we uh, call the burst limits. So that's a limit where basically we really want to have uh, guarantees around what is the maximum consumption per block, right? We don't want blocks to be like too big, otherwise they just re don't reach nodes in time. We don't want to, like that they take too much time to process, all these kind of things. So, so all the blue variables we want to really have, have, have um, fixed assurances per block. And then the orange ones, the, the state growth, the history growth, those are like what we call sustained limits, right? So we don't really care how much extra history uh, growth a single block um, um, causes. It's about what is the maximum average, right? So a thousand blocks, how, how much do they contribute to history growth and how much history growth is there in a, in a given year or something? Uh, and so, um, and so basically, um, pre, sorry, yeah, sorry. So pre 1559, what we did was we basically just took the same gas limit and said, we just use it for both the burst and the sustained limit, right? And like, I don't know, we just don't care what kind of limit it is. But if you think about it, it really has quite different properties. So the burst limit is a hard limit per block. They really have to enforce. Whereas the sustained limit, you can, you can, you can go above that in, in, in an individual block. You really only care about the averages. And so it just turned out, um, and just by pure coincidence, that that, is, that, that has uh, good synergies with the, what we wanted to, like the design goals behind ERP 1559. So basically, we wanted to make, in a sense, make demand legible um, to the protocol so that we can like have the base fee and extract it instead of paying it to the miners. Um, and we, we, yeah, we did this by basically having this base fee be an explicit var um, a variable in the protocol. And the, the thing is like whenever the demand decreases, uh, that is immediately legible to the protocol, right? We didn't have to do anything about that because um, blocks just are no longer full. In like before pre-5059, pre basically blocks were always full. After 5059, if you didn't do anything, like if the base fee is too high, blocks are just not full. The problem is you don't have an equivalent mechanism on the other direction, right? Um, if the demand increases, but blocks were already full, you, like from the inside, you don't even, like you, there's nothing, you, you don't see anything about that. And so um, we wanted to also make that legible. And so um, thinking about these like burst and, um, and sustained limit, limits, basically there was this very natural solution of just um, saying we, we split those, right? Instead of ha just having a single gas limit in a block, we, we use the gas limit just for like this burst, for limiting the, the, the burst usage. But then we have the separate uh, ga a gas target, which is in our case like half, half as much of the, of the limit. And that is basically now the sustained limit, right? So basically all the assurances around how much on average uh, many blocks in a row will use, that's now this, this gas target. And uh, in, in that way, we just basically very naturally also made the kind of the, 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 the other case, like the demand increases observable um, by the protocol. Um, if you kind of followed along with, with, with that explanation so far, there might be two questions. I mean, I guess maybe, I don't know, a couple questions, but two in, in, in particular that you might have been asking. And the first one is, wait a second, but if you actually change the burst limit and the, like you decoupled the burst and the, um, the sustained limit, wouldn't that have required like a repricing of like basically the resources like by type two X um, against each other? And then the other one, um, also, doesn't that mean that now the, all the burst limited resources are basically on average only half utilized, right? Like, is, isn't that like an efficiency loss? And um, so for the first question, it just turns out there was, again, just another coincidence. We had this mechanism called like refunds in Ethereum that already had the, basically the same property that like individual blocks could basically, I mean, I'm kind of generalizing a little bit, but could basically be, be 2x the, the, the total throughput. Um, and so we, 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 at the same time, we introduced this 5059 mechanism. We removed refunds, and that way, basically, we didn't have to deal with any repricing. It just, um, I guess, we we got lucky. The second question is the more interesting one, right? Like, um, indeed, if you have this 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 target, so in, on average, gas is only half full. 
but you have these types of resources, um, and we, we can look at them again, right? The, 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 the blue ones that basically you could, every single block, you could just go to the maximum, you wouldn't care, care right? You basically, on average, you're wasting half your bandwidth, you're wasting half your compute, uh, half your state access, half the memory. It's just basically not, not, not being used. So isn't that a problem, basically, right? I mean, it was, of course, already a problem with the refunds before, so it's not like a new problem with the mechanism, but shouldn't, shouldn't we, like, isn't that still a problem, basically? And, uh, as I was saying on that slide before, yes, but, so there is a but, um, and if you, if you basically look at this list, it, it turns out that most resource types, they actually kind of, they don't only have, a, have like a burst limit or only have a sustained limit, they usually kind of like have this, uh, this kind of this interesting um, pattern where they, they affect both sides. So if you, if you talk about bandwidth, right, the, how, how big the individual blocks are, those blocks aren't only gossiped, and so have this immediate burst um, um, concern, but then they are also saved on a disk as part of the history, and so they also contribute to the history growth, right? So, th so, so basically, block size has both a bandwidth constraint, but then also history growth constraint, and so it actually has a constraint on both sides of the of this diagram. And, and similarly, state access, it's a little bit more tricky than I made it out here to be because it's only about state access at new locations. State access at existing locations only is burst limited, but state access at new locations, extending the overall state size, that also has a has a sustained limit. And um, basically, that kind of re rescues us here, uh, at least to some extent, because um, as, as I was saying, right, many resources basically have both limits, and usually, uh, they are limited actually then by the um, by the sustained limit, right? So, so um, the main concern, for example, we have with um, with uh, state access, right? State growth is that that it is not like the kind of the the, the uh, time it takes within a single block to access the state. It's it's really about like how quickly can Ethereum state grow, right? And this is the main con binding constraint here, and so. Um, in, in these these type of resources basically are just not affected by um, by this de uh, decoupling at all. But and this is actually like a constraint for in general for just for um, any 1559 style mechanism on Ethereum. It is true that resources that are only burst limited are on average underutilized, or basically you can't on average basically reach their maximum utilization under any type of 1559 style mechanism. Now, this is not not the problem this talk is trying to solve. This is just basically po point, pointing this out. Um, but it is, I think, a, a really important design uh, consideration here. Um, and then, basically, with that as background, now kind of like, I mean, we already talked about resources, but what would it, what basically, why do we want to maybe move to having actually multidimensional resource pricing? I don't, what would that even mean? Um, and for that, uh, first kind of, uh, I want to talk just briefly about like what actually are the problems with one-dimensional pricing. And there's really one problem that I, I think I consider that being like the main one, and that's uh, again resources un under utilization, uh, but of a of a different a different kind. And to 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 look at this, it's really pretty obvious once you see this graph. It's basically just, I mean, it's a pretty bare bones graph. But um, so this is part one of the graph. <laughs> so basically, if you if you today on Ethereum, right, you have resource A, resource B, just like the tr single, like the simple two-dimensional case. So that one could be compute, the other could be bandwidth, whatnot, right? You basically because they both contribute to the gas consumption, but you only have a fixed amount of gas per, gas per block. You can basically use only compute or only data, or if you want to use both, basically they they kind of they have this trade-off relationship that is artificial, right? You, you wouldn't want them to have this trade-off relationship because actually you could like use the maximum allowable of both dimensions, but right now in this one-dimensional pricing, that's just not possible. So what we want is actually this, right? We actually, and of course, like in the if you imagine like the five-dimensional case, that would be some, I don't know what they're called, hyper rectangle or something. I think that's actually the word. Um, and so um, and so basically this is this is really the desirable outcome, right? We, we want, we, we still have these limits, right? You can't use more than the kind of the limit of resource B and resource A, but we want any combination of those two to be possible, right? And this is kind of, this is what the, what, what would, this multi-dimensional pricing would enable because all of these resource types would just be basically treated and, and accounted for individually. Uh, other problems is um, that we have this 2x burst multiple in the 1559 style mechanism right now over all uh, resource types. And some of them actually 2x kind of makes sense if you think about it. Otherwise, the kind of the burst limit also starts to be more problematic. As we were saying, in, in, in these only burst limited resources, 2x is already kind of costly because it wastes resources. 
But other, other resources, we could have 10x, 100x, and it wouldn't matter. And it would actually allow for much easier, much, like much more interesting 50, 59, uh, much more sensitive targeting, um, 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 uh, like, like adjustment uh, solutions, right? So basically, this is just kind of like an annoying side effect uh, of, of, of the kind of one-dimensional pricing. Um, also, uh, and that's more like a forward-looking uh, statement, new resource types that we are like about to introduce on Ethereum um, are less correlated with the existing ones. And so basically, the, the, these problems basically will become um, bigger going forward and it would require like frequent manual re, um, kind of relative pricing adjustments. So basically, we would have to go in every few weeks and basically we have a hard fork that just says, okay, wait a second, kind of the market condition changed. And I mean, ideally, we would want to go in once every hour or something, right? And just basically change the relative gas prices. And that's, of course, just, just not feasible, right? And um, for... For, for that, basically, the, the, the solution is really kind of, I mean, that's kind of the whole talk, right? Just kind of like uh, giving, giving that intuition. We really would want to price all these resources uh, individually. Um, an interesting case study, that, and that's kind of, that only came out of uh, actually the sessions we had uh, earlier this week, is um, layer two call data. So, so why is this such an interesting case study? Um, if you are on a layer two, right, um, and in, in, in particular, the, the, these were conversations we were having with, with Arbitrum and, and Optimism and whatnot, but, of, but I think that that really holds true uh, among all layer twos. Um, there's a new type of resource, and that's layer one data, right? Because not only do you have all the, the kind of the, the cost associated with running a transaction uh, on layer two and, uh, and the, the constrained resources there, but then also those have to be anchored on layer one, and in particular with data, like uh, in computation, you can compress really efficiently uh, as a rollout. That's the whole point, right? But data, you can't really compress. So you still have to pay for the full uh, layer one data availability. Uh, in principle, it's still like a burst limited resource, although it would only ever reach this limit if it actually consumes all of the available layer one data. So in practice, it isn't really like the limit isn't really relevant. Um, but Actually, this for the first time is a resource that actually where well, you actually you're paying for the cost. You're not only paying for like to in order to basically express your kind of your um, desire for resource consumption. It is actually a, a, a real cost uh, that that has to be accounted for. So in this case, the sequencer has to actually go go out and buy the underlying layer one data, and. This, the, the, this kind of this relative price, so kind of the price for layer one data and then for layer two execution, they, they as, as I was saying earlier, they are like less correlated with each other, so they are very heavily fluctuating. And so you would really have to go in probably in every hour or something and just, I mean, maybe even when an NFT drop happens or something like within five minutes and be like, wait a second, now all of a sudden data is really expensive on a rollup. And this, this just does not work, right? So we really need this two-dimensional um, uh, uh, mechanism uh, here um, very, very uh, importantly. And actually, uh, rollups have been looking into this already. Like, we basically, we, we talked to them, we're like, yeah, we have this new idea about multi-dimensional resupercising. And they were basically like, finally, <laughs> what, what took you so long? Um, and uh, it, it, it turns out, actually, that, by the way, this is also... Um, just by pure coincidence, again, very similar to the, to the problem uh, in, of, of another type of resource that we are about to introduce on mainnet, and that's why we were looking into it. And that's this, uh, if you've heard about this, like the proto-dunk sharding ERP4844 uh, blob transaction uh, pricing. And that's, again, a new type of data, and that basically you really would want to be separately priced. And so it's, it's basically, it, it, it's very similar here. And so... Um, how do we basically how 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 would this work in practice? Like how how would we how would we um, start pricing this uh, in a two-dimensional way? The first first one is just uh, especially now in the context still of layer two call data is a mechanism where we would want to determine how much like should the data cost in any given moment. So um, right basically layer twos would have to have some sort of a layer one gas price oracle. The nice thing is that that you, that can be done in a trustless way because I mean they already uh, are based on top of layer one. Um, and then in the case of blob transactions on mainnet, you just have like another independent 1559 star targeting mechanism where you just to, to say like, this is the amount of blob data we want on average, this is the amount of blob data in the extreme, like as a, as a burst limit, and then you basically just uh, do, the, do the typical 1559 uh, stuff. Um, and then this point, and that's actually uh, just because, again, this, this, this part of the presentation was basically only done to, uh, this week. So this is kind of where I'm the most sad. I didn't have more time to kind of like really explain this a little bit more um, just because it's really interesting. But like if you're interested in that, like go for, come find me afterwards. So um, how do we actually um, 
how would we actually charge um, um, people for this specific for this two-dimensional resource uh, consumption? And they're like uh, they're basically two two approaches that are used right now by rollups. Um, and that's one is the floating correlator gas consumption, and I think that is the arbitrum way of doing it today. So that's basically um, instead of having a fixed gas price um, per correlator byte or something, it basically just varies the, the gas consumption based the, so, so that basically the total amount of uh, amount you pay um, exactly accounts for the for the layer one cost right so so all of a sudden you have this this floating gas cost and so that basically bre um, breaks this invariant that we were talking about earlier that basically you you f uh, you fix these relative gas costs of the individual resources and that allows you to have this floating mechanism and the other uh, alternative approach here, uh, that's the optimism approach right now, is that you just basically charge the user in ETH directly for, for that part of the cost. Um, and um, that, yeah, but both of these mechanisms have some advantages, some disadvantages. Again, not enough time to go into that right now. But uh, just to basically outline here the open questions, and as I was saying earlier, I basically have to end the talk right when it starts to get interesting. So this is this would be already closing in on the end, but open questions here. Um, also, like looking towards extending this into like the multi-dimensional case, not just two dimensions. So, how would we actually charge users for that, right? How, how would that part of the mechanism work? What parameters would we want to expose? So, uh, basically, that could be something like a max ETH per blobs in the very uh, or, or per, per, per call data or something in the very simple two-dimensional case. But how how does it scale? Would users end up having to set like 15 different gas limits for their transactions? Um, also, 15 different priority fees. Then, like how how, how would basically does it look for the user? Um, which dimensions and resources do we actually end up like one, wanting to, to, to basically separate out and have, have as individual um, atomic uh, types of, of, of resources? Um, how does that work with this kind of the burst sustained limit that we talked about? Um, again, some resources only have a burst limit. Um, how, how would we basically do that there? Do we basically have to only have a very small multiple so we don't lose too much of the, of the average um, available resources, uh, resource usage basically? Um, and then, and that's a really big one as well, how do we ensure backwards compatibility? And is specifically, this is really important for dynamically metered resources. So what's that? Luckily, um, uh, layer two call data and blob transactions are not dynamically metered, right? You basically, you can look at a transaction from the outside and you can just say, yes, it has this much call data or this much blob data. But some other types of resources, right? Like how much like storage accesses, um, computation, you only basically, see how much uh, the trans transaction consumes while it is running, right, doing execution. And inside of the EVM, there's a lot of baked in assumptions about how this is being metered, right? Like when you, when you do subcall, you, you send a fixed amount of gas with that subcall. That's a one dimensional value. So you can't all of a sudden make that five dimensional. That just wouldn't work with this existing contracts, right? So you basically have to find a way to, make, to also make these types of, of, of resources and resource pricings um, compatible. And um, so what's the plan here, basically? Uh, again, as I was saying, this is like the very early stages of just exploring this. So short-term goal is just design a mechanism, a simple mechanism for this, this two-dimensional use case, so layer two transactions and blob transactions. And I think layer two is very adamant that like they need this fast, otherwise they'll just do their own thing. And I mean, of course, fair game, but it would be nice to have a standardized solution. So um, we also really want to get blob transactions into the next hard fork after the merge. So we want to have this mechanism like fixed in place within a reasonable t amount of time. Um, we do want, though, to make sure that, that this, whatever we end up picking for the two-dimensional case, that this is forward compatible, right? So it, it should really be easy to extend it to the full multi-dimensional pricing case here. And, um, and then basically this would be the third step, like then actually afterwards designing this full multi-dimensional pricing system. And of course, as a last step, n never to forget, uh, utopia. So, so that's, uh, that's where we want to end up in. Um, yeah, and that's basically uh, all. So. I guess thanks for for the attention, and if you um, want to find the slides, uh, you can you can find them on my Twitter. Thank you, Ansgar. What I love about the AP one five five nine is that it gave introspection to the protocol, like it knows how much resources it's using, and this is a way of just multiplying the granularity of, of that introspection. And it, I think, is crazy what we can achieve with a better system such as this. But yeah, thanks for the talk. Is there any question from the audience? Alex. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, Ansgar. I have two questions, maybe some 
maybe one will be, I don't know, maybe I'm not understanding it correctly. Does it make sense for this multi-dimensional pricing for all of that to be priced in the same unit? Because even though they would be like multiple dimensions, one dimension, if you need a lot of ether, for example, for one resource in particular, it's going to affect the price of the other resources. Not in uh, the ether unit, but relative to like USD, for example. Does that make sense? So, so basically, the, the the point here would be that you'd have to um, price them in separate units, and then right. at the end, you, you of course have to map that down to like a common ETH price or something that users would would pay, right? But you, if if I don't know, the the price for storage would two x, that would not affect the price for compute. But um, if if you need ether for both, now there's more demand for ether for storage than for the other resource, right? Maybe, right. maybe the, the right, right, right. But like, how, how would that? I mean, I'm asking you. I mean, maybe it's not a good question. No, no, no. I mean, it's it's, it's an interesting point. I, I don't I don't think that kind of the demand for ETH just because in that like in good approximation is basically infinite in the just the scope of a single block. So I don't I don't think that those are that. The, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to think about it a bit. But yeah. Okay. I, thank I'm you. Happy to talk. I about have like more. a second question. Small. Right. Uh, are there any use cases or applications that you see enabled by multi-dimensional pricing? Uh, use case replications. What do you mean by replications? Uh, but for example, we could be able to do better parallelization because we'd be able to like price resources right. in a different way. Or stuff oh, that's like that's that. a really really good question. I would say once we have a framework like that, it it would yeah it would enable us to think better. Well, well, first of all, it's just I think it's really good to just have explicit what our limits for the individual resources are, so that we can see where are the bottlenecks, and we can just start kind of optimizing for them more. And then we can ask about like what are maybe implicit hidden other resources, right? Like how does this relate to parallelization? It's actually a really good question, right? If you look at other blockchains that really focus on parallelization, I don't know, Solana is just like uh, one of them that really focuses on that, right? Um, that's exactly what they're doing, right? Have specific pricing for like overlapping state access. So that could be something where we, we could, now that we have this framework, I think it lets us ask this question in a better way. Like basically, now we could talk about it as a specific type of resource and how to in, like integrate that into our pricing framework. And I, I think that would unlock new, new use cases, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ed first. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I was happy to see the uh, discussion about burst versus sustained uh, resource use. I think that's a really important consideration in practice. Um, in 1559, the burst is defined over a time frame of one block. Um, but it could be that for some of these resources, the relevant burst time is, uh, you know what I'm ask, gonna ask, mm -hmm. yeah, that the relevant burst time is longer. So I'm just gonna ask how painful that it would be if the burst was defined with respect to a time of, say, a minute or two minutes or five minutes. Um, sustained, of course, is always sort of long term. Right. I think this is a really good question. Actually, why I went back to the slide is just to point out kind of that there's also an effect in the opposite direction. So like I, I kind of have a memory be kind of a slightly off color here. And that's just because memory, interestingly, is uh, really uh, limited only per transaction. So not even per block, right? Per, per transaction, because after every transaction, you can just throw away all the memory it used and you start fresh again. So this is kind of this is an example for the opposite case. So we would already have to integrate something that does not neatly fit into the per block um, pattern into this mechanism. And then actually, I think basically these longer term, longer window um, examples are probably again like, a, like I would say something that's more relevant in the layer two case, I assume, right? Because on, on the base layer, we have this very fixed 12 second slot time. So we can't really, there's no wiggle room. Everything that's per minute is just five times per block for us. Um, but I th yeah, I think it's basically, it that, that is the whole intention here. I think we would want to come up with a framework that is as flexible as possible and really can be applied throughout EVM use cases. And so it would really, hearing that, that basically makes me just mentally add it to the list of requirements. Make it not strictly operate only under the assumption that these things are limited per block. Yeah. Okay, we'll have time for one more question. Thanks. Uh, do you have any thoughts on blob pricing when, say, blob and cold data both use the same resource? Like they both use storage. So a block mm -hmm. with a lot of cold data and a big blob could be different to a blob, uh, block with a small amount of cold data. Uh, 
Right. Um, yeah, this is actually, again, um, uh, a really good point. So I think basically <laughs> most of the complexity is hidden kind of in this picture, where basically it's, it's about, um, first of all, I mean, of course, where would you even integrate blob data here? And then, like, how do these individual resources even overlap? Again, I'm like, state access, state growth, that's me just cheating because they barely overlap, right? It's only about access to new state, and then how do you handle resources that partially overlap and then partially don't? Um, yeah, I, I think this is, like, I mean, of course, you can always do the stupid thing and basically within that context revert back to the status quo. So you just basically say, okay, we have the combined limit and then we just accept that we basically are in the bad triangle um, case again, right? So like either only call letter consumption or only blob consumption or like somewhere in between. But of course, you wouldn't want this, right? So um, again, so, like this is really the problem. Like you can you can describe the the, the the problem and like if you just make enough simplifying assumption, it looks like it's pretty easy, but then you start diving in and actually coming up with a mechanism that like optimally accounts for all of this is really quite a challenge. So I don't think it will be like an easy thing to do. Um, but also, I mean everything is better than what we're doing right now. Right? We're doing right now is this in five dimensions, in ten dimensions. So we're really wasting like the vast majority of our possible throughput. So anything that gets us away from this and closer to optimal, I would already be happy, happy with. But yeah, great question, actually. Yeah, thanks, Ansgar. Super nice. Let's give him another round of applause.